church? Happy birthday. You say thank you. Let's try it again. Happy birthday. All right. You know why I'm saying happy birthday? What day is today? Pentecost day, right? So it, you know, people call it the, the, the birth date of a, of a church. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But before we get there, I just want to welcome you. If you're here for the first time, we're really glad that you're here together with us where we can worship, we can pray together, we can listen to God's word together. And so we're just, just glad that you could join us here today. My name is Vasily. I'm one of the pastors here at Good News Church, and we're glad that you're here. If you're watching us online, welcome. We're glad that you could connect uh, to our YouTube channel as well. Uh, a brief announcement. Um, first of all, I know that, the, that she's not here, but uh, one of our members, uh, Anastasia Jovnir, uh, got married yesterday. Let's give a round of applause. We have some family members and her father here with us. Now, the father looks a little bit more relaxed and happy today than he did yesterday, I think. So, so I'm really glad that's the case. Uh, congratulations. May God bless this new family. And we're just, just thankful that we can share in that joy as a church as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, another brief announcement is that um, um, I've mentioned uh, at the second service last Sunday, but I didn't mention it at the first service. So we're doing, doing it again. Uh, this, um, for the next three weeks, Irina and I are not going to be here because uh, our elders are sending us to visit our missionaries in Ukraine. And so tomorrow, actually, tomorrow morning, we're leaving to the airport and we have an action-packed three-week itinerary. Uh, we're going to be visiting all the uh, missionaries that we're supporting in Ukraine, or at least the vast majority of them. Uh, we're going to be in, in Kiev, in Irpeň, we're going to be in Lutsk, we're going to be in Lvov, we're going to be in uh, Dnieper, and then, uh, thankful to uh, Pastor Michael, uh, we've uh, actually been invited to be part of the national prayer breakfast there, both in Kiev and in Jerusalem, uh, as they're celebrating their 70th anniversary uh, of Israel, of reestablishment of Israel as a country. So we have a privilege of going there for a couple days. So please pray for us. There is a lot of tension right now in Israel, as you have seen on TV. Uh, and uh, it's a privilege, but it's also, you know, how, how everything is going to work out. We're not really sure. So your prayers are needed. They are appreciated. And we're just uh, really glad that we'll have this opportunity. This is going to be our first time. Um, I've been to... Uh, Donetsk when I was a little kid, but other than that, I've never been to Ukraine, so um, I'm going to try to see what most of you are so excited about when you're talking about your home country. Uh, I might take a selfie in Vushavanka for you and post it online, I don't know, so we'll, we'll see. Um, but but for, for on a serious note, just, just please pray. Um, it's a big trip, kids are going to be away from us. I know they're excited about that, we're not so much, but three weeks is a long time, so we would appreciate your prayers and support. And now I'd like to uh, get uh, into the text with you. Uh, we are going to uh, fast forward a little bit. As you know, we're doing an overview of the 66 books of the Bible from a chronological perspective. We're going, trying to go kind of in order. Uh, we're skipping a little here and there because of different holidays and celebrations. But for the most part, we're doing it chronologically as we think it happened. And we've finished the Old Testament overview, and we're doing the New Testament overview. We've started um, uh, nine Sundays we're spending on, on the uh, parables of Jesus, the stories that Jesus have used to illustrate a certain truth. And then we're going to move on to the miracles of Jesus. We're going to talk about the different miracles that he was doing while he was on this earth. But today we're going to take a little bit of a break, and today we're going to uh, focus on the birthday church of the church the day of the Pentecost it's a big deal it's a big holiday it's an important holiday in a sense that uh, when we think back to the beginning of how the church function and what happened it actually is very very important so what is Pentecost well Pentecost is um, not to be confused with the past Pentecostal denomination, but the day of Pentecost is a day that we celebrate the descent, the arrival of the Holy Spirit on the disciples, on the disciples, on the followers of Jesus. And so it happened to them while they were celebrating uh, another holiday called the Feast of the Weeks. And the Feast of the Weeks traditionally was celebrated seven 
weeks after um, the, the Easter, uh, seven days after, after the uh, traditional dinners that, that the Jews had and the celebrations during which they've come into, into Jerusalem. And so what would happen is uh, they would get back together again seven weeks later, which is 49 days. And so the day of Pentecost, Pente means 50. So 50 days after that is what we're talking about. About a, you know, a little less than two months, a little bit more than a month and a half. And so the disciples and other followers of Jesus, they are in Jerusalem. Why are they in Jerusalem? Who can tell me? Why are the disciples in Jerusalem? They're celebrating. Yeah, I just said it. That's right. Thank you for listening. Uh, what else? They're also in Jerusalem because Jesus told them to do that. Jesus told them very specifically, and he gave them the instructions. On the final days before his crucifixion, Jesus started talking about the arrival of the comforter. He started talking about the arrival of the helper. In fact, if you open up your Bibles, please, to John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. John 14, 15 through 17. Here's what it says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This right here is an incredible statement. It's actually a very fascinating piece of doctrine in these just a couple of verses. What we're seeing here is the incredible work of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And here in just two verses, Jesus is saying, I will ask the Father. The Son asks the Father to send whom? The Spirit. Send the Spirit, an incredible work of the Trinity. And so, to be very clear, they're not independent of one another. This is a mystery that we cannot fully comprehend. This is not a mystery that's waiting to be explained. And uh, we're going to do a couple illustrations here later, but no illustration is going to be fully explaining the mystery of the Trinity. And I just pray that one day we will get to know it a little bit better when we're in eternity with our Lord. But when we're talking about Trinity, we're saying that they are distinct, but they are one. They are distinct, but they are one. Look at what John 14, 18 says. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, who is saying these words? Who is saying them? Jesus, right? So Jesus is saying, you will not be orphans. I will be with you. And yet, he is actually leaving. He ascended into heaven. And so what happens is Jesus is promising the disciples the Holy Spirit. And then at the same time, he is promising them that he will be with them forever. And at first, it may seem like a, a contradiction. Well, wait a second. If you're leaving and you're saying, I'll send you the Holy Spirit, how can you remain with us? Well, it starts making sense when you remember that it is the Trinity that we're talking about. And so when Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is coming, He is with us because they are one, one God. It is Trinity. They're distinct, but one. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. When Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to us, He is promising Himself to us. When the Holy Spirit is sent to us, God Himself is here with us. And then Matthew 28 will start making sense. Matthew 28, 20. Here's what it says. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Jesus is with us because the Holy Spirit is with us with us. And that's supremely important. Supremely important. I, I uh, have a question. How many of you are, are Apple fans here? Raise your hands. We have remedial 
training with you guys later on. But this is an Android phone. How many of you are Android fans? Raise your hand. All right, awesome. So this is the more righteous side of the, of the, of the room right here. So on, on a serious note, this is a phone, right? And I like this phone. I, I stopped buying cameras because the cameras are so good on these phones now. You can take pictures and you can record stuff and everything is synchronized with your computer. You can take notes. You know, you have fast internet connection. I mean, just everything's fantastic, right? This is a Google Pixel, right? So love the phone. Great. But what happens when the battery on this thing dies? What is it good for? Paperweight, what else can you use it for? Cup holder, maybe a hammer, not a very good hammer, but maybe. You see, it's still there, it still looks the same way, it still is made up of the same thing, it's still got the same components, but it does not fully perform its function. And so you see, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about something very similar, in a sense that when the Holy Spirit is sent to us, God is with us, God is present, and when the Holy Spirit is not with us, then we're missing an absolutely critical component of our existence. Why? Because there is no power. We can perform our function. In fact, we can see that something similar happened to the disciples. Just put yourself into their shoes. They're with Jesus. They're following Jesus for a long time. Jesus enters Jerusalem and they hail him as a king of the Jews. The palm, the palm trees and leaves everywhere. There's purple clothing. I mean, it's just, just incredible celebration. He enters Jerusalem as a king. He's hailed as the king of the Jews. And yet a short time later, he's hanging on the cross with that same title, king of the Jews. What disciples expected did not happen. In fact... He, they kept asking him, when is he going to you know, establish his kingdom? When is this going to happen? When are we going to get rid of Romans? Jesus died, was resurrected on the third day, and then he spends about 40 days with his disciples. He spends uh, a period of time, 10 days before the Feast of the Weeks, he spends with them, walking with them, he eats food with them, he talks to them, he teaches them, he encourages them, he gets them equipped for ministry, he is with them. There is no doubt whatsoever that Jesus was resurrected and it is some, it's not some myth because people for a month and a half were able to touch his hands that were pierced by the nails. Lots of people, not just disciples. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. He was walking with them. He was teaching them. And then, before he ascends into heaven before them, he gives them some instructions. Well, what are those instructions? They're written in the book of Acts. And by the way, we're going to spend quite some time in the book of Acts, but when we get to it, in about six months. But right now, we're just going to focus on the very beginning of the book of Acts, the arrival of the Holy Spirit, because we're talking about the birthday of the church today. And so, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And while staying with them, this is talking about Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus knows what's coming, and he's telling his disciples, go into Jerusalem and wait, don't leave. The promise that the Father has given you, it's, it, it's coming. It's going to happen. It's going to happen soon, just a few days from now. And then the Spirit comes. And that's what chapter 2 of Acts is all about. And so let's together read this. It's a rather long pass package, or passage rather. We're going to read the first four verses of the book of Acts, and then we're going to read verses 22 through 47. So let's go ahead and read it together. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Remember, because Jesus told them that. And they were celebrating the Feast of the Weeks. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues 
as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then we're going to skip to verse 22 and we're going to leave um, a portion of the uh, uh, Peter's sermon where he is quoting uh, a prophet out and we'll, we'll come back to it later in, a, in, a, in another Sunday, but on another Sunday. But right now, starting with verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves, yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh, was, my flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to hates, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I, say, I may, may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to hates, nor did he see flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we're all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you have crucified. Now when, you, they, when they heard this, they were cut to heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words He bore witness, and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received His word, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe up came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What an incredible event. What an incredible occurrence. Disciples are probably a little bit confused. The Romans are still around. They were asking Jesus about the kingdom again. Jesus died, rose again, and yet they ate with him, touched him, walked with him, listened to him. He comes back, or he ascends into heaven with a promise to come back the same way. But then the Spirit would come first. That's the promise that must be fulfilled. So they're waiting for 10 days. They're waiting. They meet together in this room in Jerusalem and awaited for the promise to be fulfilled. And then something happened.
Did you guys expect that? That's what the Holy Spirit did. It says suddenly. That's what the word suddenly means, unexpectedly. <laughs> when something happens and you don't expect it, it happens in a way where you, you're not anticipating that it's going to happen right now. They were surprised. They were, they were astonished. They were un, it was happening unexpectedly. But that's exactly what happened. Is The Holy Spirit rushed into the world. He rushed into that room. And He rushed into their hearts. And He filled them. He filled them. And then He manifested Himself through a visible sign as if it was a fire. And each one of them had this flame. I, I can't picture it. Maybe it was a little flame. Maybe it was a big flame. What color it was, I don't know. But it manifested itself as a flame above each one of them. That's a big deal. Because we often think that the gospel of Jesus Christ begins with the resurrection or his birth and death and resurrection, whichever. And it ends with his ascension into heaven. But that's not all. Because if that was true, then church, then all of us, all we would be is historians. All we would be is the passive observers who are telling a story of what happened a long time ago. There would be no continuation of what God is doing in the world today. There would be no continuation of the incredible things that God is working through so many of you this very day. But the good news is that the work of God does not end there. It's not finished. The salvation of our souls for eternity in presence with God, that work is finished. But something else happens. Something else continues. And that's done through the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that continues the gospel story. It demonstrates to us. It shows us that Trinity, how it works. And it shows us the working of the Holy Spirit in us. And so there are a few things, really just a couple of things I want you to walk away with from this text. Two things that we're going to focus on today, and then as we continue the study of the book of Acts, we will, uh, we will get back to it. And by the way, this book of Acts, some people are, you know, traditionally it's called the book of Acts of the Apostles. But the reality is, is that it talks more about the Acts of the Holy Spirit through Apostles. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the first thing I want you to remember is this. Holy Spirit lives in every believer. The Holy Spirit is present and lives in the heart of every single believer. And sometimes this can be a source of confusion because we have these different terminology that's being used by people interchangeably. So when we're talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we say the Holy Spirit dwells in us or lives in us, what we're really talking about is something different when we're talking about being filled by the Holy Spirit. They're not the same thing. They're very related, they're very similar, but you have to have a distinction between the two in order for it to make sense. Here's what I want you to remember. Being born of the Spirit, being baptized by the Spirit, means being made alive spiritually. You see, every single one of us was dead. Every single one of us who accepted Jesus, whom Jesus has called to Himself, we were dead spiritually. We were a slave to sin. And now we are regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit transforms us. We are changed. We have a new nature. And now we're no longer a slave to sin. What that means is, it doesn't mean that we're not going to sin anymore. What it does mean is now we have the power to say no to sin. Now we have the ability to say no to sin because we're not a slave to that sin anymore. When you're a slave, you don't have that option. You can't say no to your master. Your addiction rules over you. Your sin rules over you. But when you're born again, you have the power to say no. You have the, the strength by the power of the Holy Spirit to resist that particular temptation. 
And so being born of the Spirit means that you are alive spiritually. In fact, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says this, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. What this is saying is that once you hear the gospel, if you respond to that good news, if you respond to the very idea that we were insufficient, we were sinful, we were at war with God, we were in rebellion with God, and we had a problem, that problem called sin, even though God originally created us for peace and eternity with Him. And so that problem could only be resolved through Jesus. Jesus restored us by what He did on the cross to a relationship with our loving Father. And now we're righteous again. Didn't deserve it. But Jesus made that possible. And so you hear that as the gospel. You hear that. You believe it. You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your life. And then something happens. You are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in the heart of every believer from the moment of believing. Say amen if you believe that. Amen. That's what we're talking about when we're saying the Holy Spirit lives in us or dwells in us. It doesn't happen 20 years later. It doesn't happen three years later or a year later when you get baptized. It happens when you repent. It happens when you repent at a church service, at home, in the car driving, or walking around a lake in the park, whatever it is that you responded to Jesus' call in your life. From that moment on, the Holy Spirit sealed your heart and was dwelling in you. When you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when Jesus comes into your life, the Holy Spirit is in your life. It's Trinity. Distinct, but one. And notice, it's for all believers. Every believer. Not those who claim to be believers, but every believer who genuinely repented and accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Every believer is sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that's why our bodies are now called temples. Not because they're super holy or they're created in such an incredible way, which they are, but that's not why. It is because now, if we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, if we're God's children and He lives in us and through us, our bodies are holy because of that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 says that, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You don't belong to yourself. It's not about you. It's about the God in you. It's about Jesus. You're not your own, for you were brought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We now belong to God, and our bodies are like temples because of the Holy Spirit that's in us, the Trinity in us. And so there is a difference between being born again of the Spirit and being regenerated and transformed and having a new nature from being filled with the Spirit. They're not the same thing. Galatians 5.16 says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, what is this talking about? If we already have the Holy Spirit in us, if we're born again, why are we being called to be filled with the Spirit over and over again. Why are we being told, you know, be filled with the Spirit? Be filled with the Spirit. Well, that already happened from the time that I believed. Well, that's because they're not the same thing. The Holy Spirit living in us and the Holy Spirit filling our lives are two different concepts. They're two different concepts. So what is the filling of the Holy Spirit is talking about? Well, it's something that is repeated over and over and over again in our lives. Being filled with the Spirit is something that we continually ask God to do in our lives. 
And we are filled by His Spirit whenever we're obedient to Him. Whenever we subject our lives to Him and His power and what He wants and His priorities in our lives. He's still living in you. But if you don't spend time in prayer, if you don't look at His Word, if you're not in fellowship with other believers, if you're not in ministry using whatever God has given you to build up His church and for His glory, well, guess what? You might be a Christian, you might be a follower, but your batteries are drained. You're not fulfilling your function in its full capacity, in its full glory. Well, that battery, what drives you forward, what gives you the ability to do that is not your own human strength. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that fills us to do His work if we are obedient to Him, if we follow His, His instructions in our lives, if we spend time in prayer with Him, if we are in fellowship with one another, and if we're serving the body of Christ with whatever He's given us. Being filled by the Spirit can be renewed by repentance and by surrendering to the will of God in your life. That's how the Holy Spirit fills you. And when He fills you, it results or it can result in miracles because your life has changed. It's different. Now you have the power inside of you to do things you never thought possible. Now, instead of being a dead phone or another piece of electronics, you are powered, charged up. You can be used to your fullest capacity by God for His glory. And sometimes God fills people with power and spirit for a specific purpose and for a specific period of time. And maybe what he, what's happening during one period in your life is not there during another period of your life, but that's God's prerogative. It's His sovereignty. It's His will. If He's accomplished His purpose, then that's what it is. Maybe He filled you with the Spirit for a specific, unique purpose. And maybe that power, then, is very specific and unique. I've, I, I thought about, you know, what illustration to choose uh, for you, for our graphics today. And so, we got these, these, these four cups here. I know, I know the camera guy is going to hate me when I, when I walk around. <laughs> but here you have four, four cups. You have these four cups, and the reality is, each one of them has what inside? Water. And so you see, it's, you know, if you were going to use this very crude analogy, the reality is that as a follower of Jesus, as a believer, each one of you has the living water inside. Each one of you has the Holy Spirit inside of you. God already changed you. You are that vessel. You are something that has the capacity to hold that water. You are something that God can fill up. You are something that's different from your dead self before that. But you know what? If we don't fill ourselves up, if we don't ask God to fill us by His Holy Spirit, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be empty. Your batteries are going to be drained. You're not going to have the ability, the drive, the motivation, the power to do things in ministry in your family, at your work, whatever it is. And so a lot of times I get asked question, well, I believe God, I, I, I accepted Jesus Christ, but man, I'm empty. What's going on? I don't have power to do anything. It could be that your glass is barely full. It's empty. When was the last time you repented and asked for God to fill your glass full of His power and saying, Lord, whatever it is, I don't know what you want me to do, but whatever it is, I'm willing to do it. I want to be obedient to you. Let me know your will for my life. You know what? If there is a need, let me fill the need of the church. The, the disciples, the apostles, they were, they were selling their stuff and they were fulfilling each other's needs. Now, to be clear, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not saying you should sell everything and live, you know, in a commune somewhere. But you are called to fulfill each other's needs. Through the abilities, through gifts, through fi financial support, through your time, how you donate your time to one another. You don't do that. And then you complain about being empty. They're not two compatible things. 
And so if you experience emptiness and lack of power in your life, it could be that yes, you're a believer. Yes, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, but you're not filled by the Spirit. Your life is lacking that power that only He can give, that peace that only He can give. You're a nominal Christian. You come to church on Sundays, you sit here for an hour and a half, you listen, you nod, and then on Monday, you're, you're back to your regular life. Friends, that's what Peter was talking about when he was preaching the good news. And they heard him, and they were cut to heart, meaning they were convicted. God spoke to them and said, something is not right with my life. Maybe some of you are speaking or being spoken to by God today, saying, you know what, something is not right in my life. People were spoken to by God at that time. They heard it, and they responded and said, what do we do? What do we do? How do we respond? And what does Peter tell him? He says, repent. Repent, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. Because you know what? If you accept the gospel, you will receive the Holy Spirit. If you believe the gospel, if you accept it, you become a follower of Jesus, you commit your life to Him, guess what? You will have the Holy Spirit in you. And then, if the dwelling of the Holy Spirit or the living of the Holy Spirit is a one-time act that happens when you believe, the filling with the Holy Spirit, the filling of this vessel is going to continue for the rest of your life. You are constantly to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? If that happens, it's going to result in something. And that's the second thing I want you to remember. Again, the first thing I want you to remember is that the Holy Spirit lives inside the heart of every believer. And then every believer is to fill their life with spirit or ask God to fill their life with spirit continuously for the rest of their lives here on this earth. But the second thing I want you to remember is this, that the Holy Spirit came to first spread the power of the gospel. The Holy Spirit came to first spread the good news through the apostles. And guess what happens? When you are filled by the Spirit, some of you have never, ever, ever testified or witnessed to an unbeliever. And chances are, the reason is, is because you're empty yourself. You've accepted Christ. You said, yep, I need it. I'm not sufficient. Good to go. But you haven't sacrificed anything. You haven't spent time in fellowship, ministry, commitment, event, nothing. You're not living your life in the way that God has called you to live it. And then you're wondering why it's not working. Because you're empty. Because if you get filled by the power of the Holy Spirit you won't be able to keep your mouth shut except to share it with others. Because that's the best news that anybody ever could possibly have. And that's what happens to Peter. He is filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? He speaks his message. The Holy Spirit speaks through him. And people respond to God. They accept him. They repent. And the church is born. People are added to the church. He quotes the Old Testament prophecy. He says, you know what? If this is what the prophet Joel was saying, this is the very Messiah that you crucified. And he tells them of the Messiah, of Jesus. Friends, people who are filled with the Spirit cannot possibly contain themselves in keeping the good news to themselves. It's not possible. It will overflow your glass. And if you want that, and if you're not experiencing that today, the answer and the solution to that is the same solution that Peter has told his Jewish brothers. Repent. Repent. If you are a believer and you've had your priorities messed up, you're to repent. And God's going to fill your cup. If you are a non-believer, if you've never made that commitment, if you haven't accepted Jesus, then repent, be baptized, and God's going to be living inside of you. The answer is the same. It's about repentance and coming to Jesus. Friends, to illustrate this drive, you see, when we want to evangelize, when we want to tell people about Jesus, it's not about 
overcoming your uncomfortable feelings, saying, you know what, grudgingly, I don't really want to do it, I hate doing it, but I know I have to do it, so I kind of am going to do it. It doesn't work like that. Let me ask you a question. If you are thirsty, what do you do? You drink water. What's driving that action? Thirst. Your thirst is driving that action, right? Now, if you're walking by a river and you see a person drowning, what do you do? You save that person. You jump in, you throw them something, you do whatever you got to do. What's driving that action? Your, your compassion. You want to be loving. You want to save a life. When you're walking on the street and if you see a kid standing on the corner of the road, crying his heart out, no adult around, what do you do? What do you do? Call somebody, ask him what happened, what's going on, let me find your parents, something, right? What drives that action? Your compassion, your love, your, your, your sense of protection towards somebody who needs it. Well, guess what? Evangelism is a natural reaction to being filled with the Spirit. Amen? Evangelism is a natural reaction to being filled with the Spirit. And if evangelism for you does not feel natural, it does not feel right, my question to you is, are you filled with the Spirit? Are you filling your life with the stuff that you should be filling it by God's grace and by God's power, by God's love, or are you filling it with junk in your life? Friends, may we be the kind of church that is powered by the Holy Spirit. That is filled by the Holy Spirit. Don't just have a Holy Spirit in our hearts. Everybody does that from the time they believe. But be filled by the Spirit with power and awe and joy. The kind of stuff that will just overflow from our lives unto others. So that we would not be able to keep our mouths closed except to tell people about what Jesus is doing in our lives and the lives of one another. Amen? All right, let us stand and pray. And friends, if there is anybody here today who needs that repentance that we talked about, as we're going to be concluding our service here, we're going to be, we're going to be singing and worshiping our Lord together. During that song, if God calls you to, why don't you come up here, we'll pray with you. You can commit your life to Jesus. Some of you need to recommit your lives to Jesus because you've been running on empty for a long time. There's nothing shameful about that. It's a continuous process, continuous repentance, continuous coming back to Jesus so that it would, our life would be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray.